I will consider Pliny the Younger and Tacitus together as they were closely connected contemporaries. Pliny the Younger was born in 61 AD and died around 113 AD. He was a Roman aristocrat and lawyer. He ended his career as Roman governor of the province of Bithynia in what is now northern Turkey. He was a prolific correspondent and many of his letters have survived. Tacitus was born in 56 AD and died sometime after 117 AD. He too was a Roman aristocrat and worked as a lawyer and politician. He was governor of the Roman province of Asia at the same time that Pliny was governor of Bithynia. Asia was in modern western Turkey and was a neighbouring state of Bithynia. He was a historian and his annals and histories have survived, though incompletely. Pliny and Tacitus knew each other well, occasionally worked together as lawyers and corresponded often. The significance of this is that there is a strong possibility that Tacitus learned what he knew of Christians from Pliny. Pliny wrote a letter to Emperor Trajan about Christians. It dates from 112 AD when he was governor of Bithynia. This is the letter as translated by William Melmoth and F.C.T. Bazanke to the Emperor Trajan. It is my invariable rule, sir, to refer to you in all matters where I feel doubtful, for who is more capable of removing my scruples or informing my ignorance? Having never been present at any trials concerning those who profess Christianity, I am unacquainted not only with the nature of their crimes or the measure of their punishment, but how far it is proper to enter into an examination concerning them. Whether, therefore, any difference is usually made with respect to ages, or no distinction is to be observed between the young and the adult. Whether repentance entails them to a pardon. Or if a man has been once a Christian, it avails nothing to desist from his error. Whether the very profession of Christianity, unattended with any criminal act, or only the crimes themselves inherent in the profession, are punishable. On all these points I am in great doubt. In the meanwhile, the method I have observed towards those who have been brought before me as Christians is this. I asked them whether they were Christians. If they admitted it, I repeated the question twice and threatened them with punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be at once punished. For I was persuaded, whatever the nature of their opinions might be, a contumacious and inflexible obstinacy certainly deserved correction. There were others also brought before me possessed with the same infatuation, but being Roman citizens I directed them to be sent to Rome. But this crime spreading, as is usually the case, while it was actually under prosecution, several instances of the same nature occurred. An anonymous information was laid before me concerning a charge against several persons, who upon examination denied they were Christians, or had ever been so. They repeated after me an invocation to the gods and offered religious rites with wine and incense before your statute, which for that purpose I had ordered to be brought, together with those of the gods, and even reviled the name of Christ. Whereas there is no forcing, it is said, those who are really Christians into any of these compliances. I thought it proper, therefore, to discharge them. Some among those who were accused by a witness in person at first confessed themselves Christians, but immediately after denied it. The rest owned indeed that they had been of that number formerly, but had now, some above three, others more, and a few above twenty years ago, renounced that error. They all worshipped your statue and the images of the gods, uttering imprecations at the same time against the name of Christ. They affirmed the whole of their guilt or their error was that they met on a stated day before it was light and addressed a form of prayer to Christ, a divinity, binding themselves by solemn oath, not for the purpose of any wicked design, but never to commit any fraud, theft or adultery and never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to eat in common a harmless meal. From this custom, however, they desisted after the publication of my edict, by which, according to your commands, I forbade the meeting of any assemblies. After receiving this account, I judged it so much more necessary to endeavour to extort the real truth by putting two female slaves to the torture, who were said to officiate in their religious rites. But all I could discover was evidence of an absurd and extravagant superstition. I deemed it expedient, therefore, to adjourn all further proceedings in order to consult you, for it appears to be a matter highly deserving of your consideration, more especially as great numbers must be involved in the dangers of these prosecutions which have already extended and are still likely to extend to persons of all ranks and ages and even of both sexes. In fact, this contagious superstition is not confined to the cities only but has spread its infection amongst the neighbouring villages and country. Nevertheless, it still seems possible to restrain its progress. The temples at least, which were once almost deserted, begin now to be frequented and the sacred rites, after long intermission, are again revived. 
which presumably means the Roman temples had been deserted because people were becoming Christians, but now they were returning to the Roman religion. He goes on, While there is a general demand for the victims, which till lately found very few purchasers. From all this it is easy to conjecture what numbers might be reclaimed if a general pardon were granted to those who shall repent of their error. So Pliny was specifically asking Trajan about how he should deal with the fact of their being Christians, rather than about how he should deal with any crimes they may have committed. Prior to his writing of the letter, he had required Christians to recant their faith, call upon the Roman gods, supplicate to Trajan's image and curse Christ. Persons who passed this test were led off. If they failed, he had them killed. It seems that Pliny had become concerned about the scale of the massacre. This prompted him to write the letter asking for guidance on these three points. Should young Christians, including children, be treated differently from adults? Is passing his test of cursing Christ, etc., good enough to get them off, and is being a Christian alone enough to condemn them, or should there also be associated crimes such as illegal meetings? Trajan replies that Pliny is doing the right thing. Christians are to be let off if they pass his test irrespective of previous allegiances, and furthermore, Pliny should not go out looking for Christians and only deal with those brought into court. Trajan also requires that anonymous evidence against Christians should not be allowed in court. These two letters do establish certain historical facts. For one thing, they show that neither Pliny nor Trajan felt ecumenical towards Christians. They also show that the Romans had found Christians sufficiently worrisome that they reached the attention of the highest authorities. They show that it was said at the time that Christians could not be made to curse Christ, and it sounds as though this is true, as some of them had gone to their deaths for not doing so. Pliny's letter also shows that Christians were worshipping Christ as a god in 112 AD, that they were numerous, and that they included both sexes, young and old, and all ranks of society, and some Roman citizens. The letter tells us that Christians worshipped Christ as a god, but not whether he had also been a man, so they don't enable us to tell whether these Christians were mythicists or historicists, and even if it did make clear that they were historicists, the letter is late enough to be consistent with the myth theory. But they do put a significant constraint on historicity. Minimal historicity holds that Jesus was initially a man who was gradually mythologised in the period following his death in the 30s AD. Pliny's letter tells us that this process of mythologization must have been complete by AD 112. Not a particularly serious constraint, but a constraint nonetheless. Tacitus' reference to Christians occurs in his Annals, Book 15, Chapter 44, and concerns the fire of Rome that occurred under Emperor Nero in 64 AD. Tacitus wrote this around 116 AD. But not human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor, and not a god could banish the infamy that the conflagration was an order. In other words, that it was arson ordered by Nero. Therefore, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and influenced the most exquisite torture on those called Crestians, hated by the populace. The author of the name had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by procurator Pontius Pilate. Checked for a moment, the deadly cult erupted again, not only in Judea, the home of the disease, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every side find their centre and become popular. Therefore, arrests were made of all who pleaded guilty. Then on their evidence, vast numbers were convicted, not so much for the crime of arson as for hatred of the human race. Derision was given to them that perished. They were covered in wild beast skins and torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses or sent to the flames, and when daylight failed were used for light during the night. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and the circus while he mingled with the people dressed as a charioteer or standing aloft. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a pity, as though it were not done for the public, but rather for one man's cruelty. So this refers to Christians rather than Christians, but the reference to death under Pontius Pilate solidly identifies the author of the name Christians as Jesus. It has been argued that the Christians referred to were not Christians, but a different group, and that the reference to Pontius Pilate was a later Christian interpolation. For one thing, Tacitus gets Pilate's rank wrong. He calls him procurator, whereas in fact he was a prefect. This is a bit odd coming from somebody who was also a high-ranking Roman official but may be understandable because the rulers of Judea were prefects up until 44 AD, after which they became procurators. Actually, there is quite an issue about Christian versus Christian. Pliny used Christian and Tacitus Christian, and both were writing in Latin. Suetonius, writing in 121 AD, also mentions Jews rioting at the instigation of a Crestus during the reign of Claudius, but as this happened in Rome, and as Claudius reigned from 41 to 54 AD, this could not have been a historical Jesus. 
a garbled reference to Christians is possible but would not help discriminate between historicity and mythicism. Early Greek sources almost invariably use Crestian rather than Christian. In fact, the Codex Synecticus originally used Crest but was altered to Christ. Anyway, even if the text is accepted as it now stands, it seems entirely plausible that Tacitus got his information via Christians, although probably not directly from them, quite possibly from Pliny. As this was some 45 years after Mark was written, the pilot reference would not contradict the mythicist's position. On the other hand, Tacitus was living in Rome at the time of the fire, though he was then only seven or eight years old. He may therefore have relied on personal recollection, eyewitness testimony, or a source that was written contemporary with the fire. If so, that might indicate that the Pontius Pilate story was circulating amongst Christians as early as 64 AD, only seven years after Paul wrote his last letter, and at least six years before Mark was written. This would put stiffer constraints on the mythicist position, but we just don't know what Tacitus' sources were. These three, Josephus, Pliny and Tacitus, are the only secular writers to refer to Jesus before 120 AD. There are several later writers who do, but they neither credit secular sources nor give dates. Overall, therefore, secular sources place constraints on the historicity and mythicism theories, but otherwise are pretty neutral on the matter.